Well, now we'll just start since everyone is really cooperative. Uh, thanks again to everyone for uh, being here this morning. And uh, I'm especially glad uh, and honored to have David Reddell with us. Uh, now, he's just a few minutes late. So, David, I can tell you I was going to do about a 10-minute, very flowery introduction uh, of David. Uh, but I, I can't do all of that, so I'm going to do the short version. You've got a longer version in your brochure, of course. But as almost everyone in the room knows, uh, David uh, is the Assistant Secretary for Communications and Information uh, at the uh, National, uh, at the Department of Commerce, uh, NTIA. Uh, he's also the administrator of uh, NTIA, so he's got that dual title. Uh, again, I've got David's full bio in the brochure, uh, so I'm, I'm going to skip that, that formality and just really say uh, off script, really, that uh, we all know David has lots and lots of important issues uh, that are on his plate. Uh, you know, we read, read about them almost every day. I'm not going to actually mention uh, what they might be because I don't want to preempt his remarks uh, at all. I, I'll just say that uh, in my own uh, personal opinion that we're very fortunate, the country's really fortunate to have David on the job uh, uh, with his uh, experience, long time experience in this area, expertise, uh, and then on top of that, dedication uh, uh, to the job and the energy he brings to the job. So with that, uh, join me in welcoming David Rattle, please. Thanks, Randy. It's, it's good to be here. And thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, so many friendly, familiar faces in the audience. It's, uh, it's nice to get out of the walls of the Commerce Building and, and see some of all of you. So uh, I appreciate particularly being here because of today's theme, getting law and policy right. Uh, that should be the goal of all policymakers. And I know for those of us that have relied for years on Randy and on the work that Free State is doing uh, on communications and economics policy issues, we have a leg up on others. So today I want to talk about three areas that NTIA is working on to get things right. Data privacy, spectrum policy, and expanding broadband. On data privacy, it's an issue of great importance to Americans, and protections for privacy date back to our founding. The Trump administration has made clear it's time to take a fresh look at how we handle privacy when it comes to our digital information, and NTIA has taken the lead role in developing the administration's policy toward consumer data privacy. We want to build consensus around a fundamentally American approach to this issue. We've been talking with dozens of stakeholders, many of whom are in this room, uh, to better understand what the problems are what we can agree on, and how we can move forward together. NTIA put out a request for comments as well, and received more than 200 responses, which I realize by FCC standards doesn't sound like many, but by NTIA standards, 200 responses is a lot of responses. We heard from a range of industries, companies, and individuals, including Free State, uh, and a few overarching themes emerged from that process. First, we heard a sense of urgency, and a desire for American leadership on privacy. For consumers and companies, data collection is now part of our everyday lives. This is relatively new, and in time, it will only become more central to how we work, how we play, and how we communicate. At the same time, the news is dominated by often negative headlines involving data privacy. From hacked baby monitors, to data theft, to home assistance devices unexpectedly recording your conversations. Any policy we adopt must reflect the changes in the use of data that have transformed consumers' relationships with technology over the past decade. Second, there is a broad industry consensus that we can't have a patchwork regulatory landscape within the US, and where there are differences internationally, we should take care not to harm the data flows that power the global digital economy. In the comments from Free State, we heard various ways to improve the Federal Trade Commission's jurisdiction over consumer privacy. You called the FTC the, quote, preferred agency to enforce privacy protections across all digital platforms, end quote. We agree that it's important to take steps to ensure that the FTC has the necessary resources, 
clear statutory authority and direction to enforce consumer privacy laws. Finally, we received many thoughtful, constructive comments on our proposed risk and outcomes-based approach to privacy. Our work on a risk-based approach is being led by our sister agency, NIST. They're of course known for their cybersecurity framework for managing cyber risks, and they'll be taking the broad outlines of that framework and applying it to privacy. The result, we hope, will be a collection of tools that anyone can use to assess and address privacy risks in any regulatory environment. Focusing on risks and outcomes is preferred to notice and, con notice and consent approaches. It's well known that few consumers bother to read long legal pri pri uh, notices. Let's be honest, most of the people in this room, I'm looking around, I know a lot of you, I'd be shocked if any of you read your, your privacy notices when you get them. We all click through them, it's pretty well known. And it's our view that giant compliance departments aren't gonna lead to better privacy outcomes for consumers anyway. We don't want companies becoming overly reliant on checkboxes and regulatory, regulatory agencies critiquing the websites of individual companies. They should be spending their time on providing real protections for consumers. A risks and outcomes focus has another benefit, which is that it doesn't entrench large established businesses at the expense of startups and small companies. If the compliance costs associated with data use are prohibitive for small businesses, we may well lose out on the next generation of innovation, not to mention the jobs and economic benefits that small businesses bring to the economy. As the administration continues to build our approach, I invite continued collaboration. In May, NIST will be hosting its second public workshop on the development of the privacy framework. It'll be held in Atlanta, Georgia, and I encourage all of you to participate. Our challenge is to create a privacy model that ensures Americans trust the technologies in their lives while guarding against the creation of obstacles to innovation that would harm our economy. A model that ensures privacy and prosperity. We believe this is possible. We can have real protections for consumers and a thriving market for the technologies that use the data. A market that's open to businesses big and small. Our path will give consumers and businesses certainty and confidence to proceed into the next generation of technological innovation. Switching gears and turning to Spectrum, this is another area that we have been very involved in and one that historically is part of NTIA's mandate. President Trump made clear that a sustainable approach to managing our nation's spectrum resources will be critical for our national and economic security in the years to come. In October, the White House released a presidential memorandum on spectrum policy that directed agencies to develop and implement comprehensive, balanced, and forward-looking national spectrum strategy, which must be ready late July of this year. The goal is to move beyond the narrow focus on piecemeal, band-by-band -band consideration of spectrum. In crafting a long-term strategy, NTIA is seeking the data and analyses we need to make strategic decisions for our long-term national security, technology leadership, international competitiveness, and economic prosperity. We received more than 50 comments. See what I meant about 200? More than 50 comments in response to our feedback. And, uh, and I again have to thank Free State for sharing their well-considered thoughts on this. We've also held listening sessions with representatives from various industry and stakeholder groups. The presidential memo also tasked NTIA with a number of other actions that will feed into the strategy. We're providing guidance to agencies as they prepare reports on their future spectrum needs. Those reports are due by April 23rd. Perhaps of note, we asked agencies to look 15 years out. Uh, that's a long time in spectrum policy and an even longer time in government spectrum use. But we thought it was important despite the uncertainty in the out years, to get a good idea of what agencies are thinking about their future needs. We're also helping agencies prepare for the mandated review of their currently current frequency assignments and quantification of that ongoing spectrum use. Finally, I'd like to give a brief update on another ongoing effort that involves innovative spectrum management techniques, our work on CBRS. In 2015, the FCC established the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, or CBRS, to accommodate sharing in the 3.5 gigahertz band between incumbent users, mostly Navy radars, and a variety of new commercial users. NTIA is working with industry and the FCC to develop a technical approach in 3.5 that will replace large static exclusion zones with smaller dynamic protection areas, allowing more efficient federal and non-federal sharing in the band. NTIA's research lab, the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, or ITS, is leading the, te the test of two key innovative technologies that are helping power these systems. ITS has a 100-year-long history of performing independent research and engineering in telecommunications, and we're excited about their work on both the SAS, the Spectrum Access System, 
and the ESC, the environmenting sensor capability. The ESC sensors are designed to alert the associated SAS when federal radar systems are operating the band so that the SAS can take action to prevent interference. ITS engineers have completed the lab testing of ESC equipment for a handful of companies that are looking to commercialize 3.5, and work on the SAS side continues. And we're working judiciously to make sharing in this band a reality as soon as is safely possible. Finally, I'd like to share a little bit about what the administration is doing to expand broadband infrastructure, especially in rural areas. We talk a lot about the promise of 5G, about the promise of the Internet of Things, of precision agriculture, and more, but even wireless innovations still need physical infrastructure, and in, more, in some cases, more than we have in place today. Across the federal government, the administration is working to boost private investment and expand broadband connectivity. In February, the White House launched the American Broadband Initiative, a comprehensive effort to streamline processes, increase funding, and make assets available to speed broadband deployment to all Americans. Agencies are working hand in hand with the telecom industry to help plan for effective actions. For example, the US Department of Agriculture is working on innovative ways to bring broadband to rural America as it implements its reconnect pilot program. The Department of Interior just made a map of its towers available for co-location. DOI's map includes thousands of towers, mostly in rural areas, that have space available for private companies to lease as they look to expand broadband service in those areas. Separately, NTIA is working to improve broadband availability data to better define where new infrastructure is needed across America. Congress last year directed us to build our previous mapping experience and the relationships we made to update the broadband availability map. I'm happy to report that the Department of Interior's map will be incorporated as part of that work. As we go forward, we've announced that we're collaborating with six, eight, excuse me, with eight initial states, California, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Tennessee, Utah, and West Virginia as our pilot states. These states will provide data and other inputs to the map so that policymakers around the country can make better decisions as they devise broadband expansion plans. We chose those states for a few reasons. First, we wanted to make sure we had geographic diversity. Second, we picked states that participate in NTIA's State Broadband Leaders Network. This is a group that formed out of NTIA's last foray into mapping and is made up of officials from around the country who are working to expand broadband in their communities. Finally, we looked for states that had active state broadband plans or programs. So we have eight states that are an ideal cross-section of the country with state and local governments that are committed to the mission of connecting all of their residents. We recently issued a contract for our mapping platform and are working on developing that platform to be opened up later this year. The initial map will include available nationwide data for every state combined with state level data from our eight pilots. In the future, NTIA will seek participation and data from additional states, territories, federally recognized tribes, as well as the broadband industry and other third parties to expand the value of the map to policymakers and make it available around the country. I really thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I, I like to think that at NTIA we're getting the law and policy right, but that can only happen with the continued engagement of all of you and the thoughtful consideration of the broad range of viewpoints that you all bring to our processes. In that spirit, I invite you to stay in touch with us. Uh, our doors are literally always open. I mean, it's a federal building, you gotta sign in, but our doors are always open. Uh, and I'd love to continue this dialogue and talk about some of the projects that we're working on today. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, David, uh, thanks again. When I said uh, that there is a lot on your plate, I, I know that was really an understatement. So we thank you for your energy and dedication. So in keeping with our tradition, uh, uh, David uh, will take a, a couple of questions. And we're going to do this throughout the day, by the way. So as we go along, if you want to uh, keep a question in mind, that'll be fine. Uh, so I'm going to call on Paul first. Just identify yourself when you get the mic, please. Paul Kirby with TR Daily. Uh, a couple questions, David. You mentioned the ESC, and you'll, you'll authorize that as soon as it's safe. Can you give us any more details on timing? And secondly, Commissioner O'Reilly has been particularly critical of the review of the 3450 or 3550, saying the rug was pulled out from under us. I guess I wanted to see if you wanted to update us on that review and any response to his criticism of that review. So I'll, I'll take the, okay. 
I'll take the, uh, the first question first. Uh, with regard to the SAS and ESC, um, we're looking forward to getting that done. It's a systems engineering problem. So you can't just look at each system in isolation. They have to work together and in a way that's effective and protects the Navy radar use that we know is critical in that band. So we're trying not to rush things, but we are getting things done with all due speed. Um, while we want to get out the door as quickly as possible, the most important thing is making sure it works. So uh, I'm excited about the work that we're doing at ITS. Unfortunately, the, the partial government shutdown set us back a little bit, but we are moving forward with due speed. Uh, on 3450 to 3550, you know, we're, con we're moving a pace to figure out what the best use of that band is. Um, it's 100 megahertz. It's got existing incumbent systems. You know, under the terms of our statute, I have to consider how to accommodate those federal systems, whether it's leaving them in place and finding ways to share or seeing if they're capable of being relocated to another band. Uh, we're going to keep working and making sure we have every option investigated and that we do what's best for maximizing the use of the band. Okay, uh, do we have another question for Administrator Rettel? Okay, I see my friend Drew, uh, and that's fine, but uh, you may not get to ask one at every single session, but hey, I, there's no one I'm else. I'm just taking advantage of a market, market opportunity. Okay, go. Uh, David, Drew Clark, hey, Broadband Drew. Breakfast. Could, could, there's been a lot of discussion about broadband mapping. You referred to it in your talk. Could you just speak about NTIA, these eight states you're working with, but really directly how that's going to interface with the FCC's reform of the 477 process. Uh, last week, I'm sure you heard a, a group uh, led by the U.S. Telecom Association uh, said that they're going to develop a pilot of, uh, at an address level in Virginia and Missouri. So again, could you just speak to how these things are going to come together? I mean, this seems like a great problem for us to have at the moment. We have a wealth of groups that are trying to produce better data. And if we are doing our jobs right, then we'll have a platform that's able to take in as much data as people are willing to give us. So we welcome the work that U.S. Telecom is doing and hope that they're uh, going to be willing to share that data with us to add as a layer to our broadband map once it is stood up. You know, Congress was very clear in uh, the fiscal 18 appropriation that our work should be to update the broadband availability map. So we have an ongoing conversation with the FCC about how to make sure we're incorporating their data. Uh, you know, they're a regulator. We are not, so um, we're working on the side of trying to put this platform together and maybe with commercial providers of data to the extent that we have the funding. Um, but the FCC as a partner is a critical part of this. So we're continuing to have those conversations, but our goal is a platform that can take in every piece of broadband data that people are willing to throw at us and put together a comprehensive picture for policymakers. Okay, if there's one more question, I'll take it and then we'll uh, uh, let uh, David Go, do we have one last question? Uh, okay, over there. Gary Arlen from Arlen Communications. Uh, 6G, 5G. Uh, last week a uh, Finnish academic institution outlined a plan for a 10-year 6G agenda. Uh, have you seen that or how will the U.S. be involved with that? Obviously the White House has expressed an interest in 6G. Uh, if you want to talk about 5G and what's going on with that, you can do that too. So I, I haven't seen the paper you're talking about. Um, I'm surprised not at all that RF and wireless engineers are continuing to look for the next great leap in spectrum technology. That's not surprising. Given how fast this field moves, um, if someone weren't doing that kind of work, that would be the real story. Uh, I think it's safe to say, whether it's our leadership in 4G, and I think our leadership there is unquestioned, uh, our race to ensure that we have 5G in this country and that we continue to be a leader in 5G, and our willingness as a country to be open to innovation and investment on anything that comes next is unparalleled. So I'm welcoming the notion that people are doing this kind of investment. I hope they're doing this kind of research and investment in the United States. That would be fantastic. Um, but we're a market that has always welcomed innovators and has always welcomed investment and, uh, and been a people who have been willing to adopt those technologies. Okay, well, I want to thank David again. Before you uh, join me in thanking him, I uh, want to give him the same small token of appreciation that I gave to uh, his Justice Department colleague. That's our Free State Foundation 
bag. Uh, you know, I told him, and it's true, some of these have been used before, so the value of them, I'm certain fits within whatever your guidelines. <laughs> and, and the fact that a Justice Department uh, uh, very senior official took one, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> must, must mean we're uh, within all guidelines. But I'd like to give this to you and thank you once again for the work you're doing and for being here this morning. Thanks for having me, Randy.